And we have Professor Jim Fuller visiting us from Caltech. So Jim got his PhD from Cornell, and then he was a postdoc at KITP and Caltech. And now he's a professor at Caltech. And today he will talk, up, he will talk, talk to us about gravity waves, it's not gravity waves. Yeah. OK. Uh, can everybody hear me? Is this working? OK, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, and thanks for taking the time to, to see it on voting day. I thought about giving you the choice to vote on what you wanted to hear about, but I thought that would get too contentious. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk about gravity waves today, which are extremely interesting kind of wave that propagates uh, usually inside of uh, fluid bodies such as stars. Uh, so really they are more like a buoyancy wave, whereas gravitational wave, of course, is just this trivial outcome of general relativity that was solved more than 100 years ago. All the interesting physics is in gravity waves. So that's, that's what I want to try to convince you of today. Um, this is a really nice simulation of the sun by Lucy Alfan. So you see the outer convection zone here. Uh, the inside of the sun, of course, is stably stratified. But the convection on the outside of the sun excites gravity waves that propagate into the core of the sun. This is one of many examples in astrophysics where gravity waves can potentially be very important uh, in different contexts. Now, those of you who thought you were coming to a talk about gravitational waves, I have one slide to appease you. Um, this is uh, one of the many interesting gravitational wave sources that we're starting to find at Caltech with the ZTF survey. So that's the Zwicky Transient Survey, or Z Zwicky Transient Factory. I think it really should be called the ZBF, the Z Zwicky Binary Factory. So we're starting to find lots of interesting systems like this. Uh, this is, I forget the phone number, but this is the shortest period eclipsing binary star known. It's a pair of white dwarfs that orbit each other with a period of just under seven minutes. And uh, in this particular case, we have already detected the gravitational wave induced orbital decay to like 200 sigma or something. So if we had just found this 40 years ago, it would have been a Nobel Prize. But uh, it's still an amazing system, and we have several more like this in the pipeline. Not, not quite the short orbital period, but we're starting to find a lot of these. So it's really fun to understand the population of merging white dwarfs, all the different transients and objects that those make. So let's talk about gravity waves again. A lot of this talk will focus on gravity waves. Also talk about inertial waves and Elfin waves and some other MHD phenomena. Um, but Gravity waves are very ubiquitous in astrophysics. They propagate inside of stars, planets. And I remember last time I was here, I learned about how they can affect things like galaxy clusters. So there's all kinds of interesting effects they have. Now, one of the reasons they're really useful is they carry information. So for instance, in astroseismology, we have learned a lot by looking at gravity modes of stars. They also carry energy and angular momentum, just like any other kind of wave. And this means that gravity waves can have a lot of effects on the long-term evolution of various objects. And this is something that has been largely neglected, I think, in a lot of the literature. And so there's, we're learning now they really have a profound impact in many scenarios. Let me show you a movie to get you acquainted with gravity waves. This is a simulation done by Andrea Cristini of carbon shell burning in a massive star. So you see the convection created by the shell burning here. But on either side of the convection, you still see fluid motions that are gravity waves. Hard to see them here. They have smaller amplitude. Here, they're pretty obvious. So these structures up here, these are gravity waves excited by the convection. Now, in this case, these gravity waves can potentially propagate out to the outer part of the star. And they actually can carry so much energy, they can do things like cause the star to have an outburst or lose mass. I said I was going to talk about that in my abstract. I'm actually, I decided to focus on something else. Um, but I'm happy to discuss pre-supernova outbursts with anybody who's interested. How well did the uh, numerically calibrated wave in the 70s compare with the previous to, I'd say to order of magnitude, they agree pretty well. There's still quite a few questions about the spectrum of waves that's generated, which can be quite important for which of these waves actually get out of the star. That's going to depend on their frequency spectrum and their wave number spectrum which I'd say is not really understood yet. Uh, the simulations don't always resolve all the scales that you need. They have often artificial diffusivities, so you have to be quite careful when you're making those comparisons. Um, Maybe is it that you care about the 
large scale what happens? It's true that you're usually worried about large scale waves, um, but the amount of power put into high frequency waves, so waves with higher frequency than say a convective turnover frequency, that can be very important. Those high frequency waves are often the ones that have the most impact. It, uh, yes, because higher frequency gravity waves actually have longer wavelengths, so they're less damped. Uh, so that, that can be quite important and that's not very well understood yet. So there are some people working on it, like uh, Daniel Lake one a has done some nice comparisons. Um, but there are still some open questions. Uh, a really interesting topic I'm not going to discuss in depth today is a, a project uh, Sarah Gosson and I just submitted uh, for publication. This is a project on how gravity waves may actually help drive core collapse supernova explosions. Uh, so what we showed is that in the center or near the center of a proto-neutron star, you excite some gravity waves because there's convection there, neutrino-driven convection. Well. Convection that results from the neutrino flux, I should say. Uh, and that can excite some gravity waves. Those can go out and actually exert a significant pressure on the shock and they can carry of order 10 to the 51 ergs per second of energy. So they can be not, probably not the dominant, but an appreciable source of energy in some core collapse supernova. And this is, uh, again, a, a, I think one of the locations where these waves can be very important, but not really discussed very much in the literature. So the first talk up topic I will focus on today is gravity waves in heartbeat stars, or perhaps more accurately, gravity modes, tidally excited gravity modes in heartbeat stars. So if you're not familiar with heartbeat stars, these are eccentric binary stars uh, that pass so close to each other at their periastron that they tidally distort each other and they can tidally excite gravity mode oscillations. So this is an example of a heartbeat star. This is roughly to scale, except for the pulsations are too large. But so you can see them, but this is a, you know, a 0.8 eccentricity orbit and the stars pass within just a few uh, stellar radii of each other at periastron. So you get a big flux variation at that point due to the tidal distortion of the stars. But you also tidally excite gravity mode oscillations that you see throughout the orbit. And you see this phenomenon in a lot of these heartbeat stars uh, that we're starting to find a lot of those with Kepler and Tess. Um, so we can learn a lot about tides in this case because we can actually see the oscillations inside the star that are potentially producing the tidal dissipation. Now we can see it directly. So we can learn about tides. It's also fun to turn these uh, visual light curves into into audio waveforms. They, each one of these heartbeat stars has an interesting sound. So this is the sound of this one. If you take this waveform and speed it up by a factor of uh, many thousand, you get something that sounds like this. So there's two major things going on. You hear the tone. The tone is basically this oscillation here, which I've shifted it into a few hundred hertz so you can hear it. Then you also hear this beating phenomenon, and that's every time we get that beat at periostron. It's, kind of like, it's like actually beating a drum. Yeah, exactly, because it's basically an impulse. Yeah. Uh, so here's another really nice uh, example of a light curve of a heartbeat star. So there's two major effects. There's this big distortion here, which occurs at periastron. That's due mainly, like I said, to tidal distortion, but also things like reflection. Uh, and then you have this tidally excited gravity mode in this case that has constant amplitude throughout the orbit. Uh, in this case, we also have a grazing eclipse. But I'm going to be focusing mainly on the excitation of these gravity modes, which are the dynamical tide. Here's what this star sounds like. It's the same idea. Now it's just kind of a lower tone because we have a lower overtone oscillation of the orbit. So these uh, tidally excited gravity modes, they have frequencies that are exact integer multiples of the orbital frequency. The reason is these stars are basically forced harmonic oscillators. The forcing occurs at every integer multiple of the orbital frequency because it's periodic forcing. And so the modes are forced to excite. They decay in amplitude away from the They don't decay in amplitude. This other one that was just a beating or so that made Exactly, yeah, yeah, good point. So in this one, it kind of looks like it's decaying, but actually what's happening is there's two modes that have almost the same amplitude in this system that are beating with each other. In this system, there's basically just one mode, 
Uh, and its amplitude is constant because its damping time is longer than the orbital period. If you take a Fourier transform of a light curve like this, you see two major signals. So one, you see this series of peaks at integer multiples of the orbital frequency. That's basically this signal right here. But you also see this other peak that stands out at, in this case, exactly 26 times the orbital frequency. That's due to this oscillation here. So we see these kinds of effects and we can, this isn't just cool, we can learn something from it. Uh, now all these heartbeat stars look different, so I'm going to focus on one or two, but there's a lot of work to be done. They all look different, so they're all telling us something a little bit differently, and this depends on things like the orbital parameters and the stellar parameters. Uh, here's another heartbeat star. You might want to cover your ears. They don't all sound so nice. <laughs> That's what that one sounds like. There we have basically two tones because uh, the tidally excited oscillation is just a few times larger than the orbital frequency. So there's a lot of these things. Perhaps the most spectacular one is this system. This is KIC 8164262. This is an extreme heartbeat star where this all looks like noise here, but this is actually a well-resolved tidally excited oscillation that oscillates at exactly 229 times the orbital frequency. So you can get really high overtone modes excited, especially if you have a very eccentric binary. So this one's eccentricity of about 0.9. This one sounds like this. <laughs> it's again a bit different. So if you zoom in on the periastron of that system, you see this large amplitude tidally excited oscillation, and you see a little blip at periastron. But in this case, it's hard to even notice over the tidally excited oscillation. These That's a good question. Uh, I would say they are mostly linear. They are not strongly nonlinear, but we do see some nonlinear effects in many of these systems. What you see is what look like daughter modes. So the, not, the G mode can basically couple with daughter modes whose frequencies sum to the frequency of the uh, parent mode. So that's a nonlinear three mode coupling effect. You do see that in some systems. I don't think we see it in this system. But so the first order, the modes are linear. Um, if you take a Fourier transform of this system, uh, you basically just see one huge spike at 229 times the orbital frequency. So that's that oscillation that's obvious in the light curve. If you pre-whiten that out, then you see a bunch of other structure. But notice this structure is all about 30 times smaller amplitude than this one. Uh, so the main thing we see is a bunch of peaks out here. These are also all at integer multiples of the orbital frequency. So these are other tidally excited gravity modes. We also see some what looks like rotational signatures. Um, so we think we can measure the rotation rate. There's probably some little tiny spots on the star. What about the satellite modes of the 229? You mean like overtones, nonlinear, like the, the harmonic of it? Oh, these. I think this is... Yeah, that's a window function, I think. Yeah. So remember, this is eccentricity of 0.9. So yeah, so what matters is more of like a pseudo-synchronous rotation rate, which is basically the rotation rate, yeah, basically the orbital frequency at periastron. Uh, I would say it's similar. It's within a factor of a few. Uh, I forget exactly what pseudo-synchronous is. And actually, you have to be careful because even your pseudo-synchronous rotation rate depends on your theory for tidal dissipation. So it is about the right, you know, it's within a factor of two or something of that rate, but it's not exactly. And I don't think we should expect it to be exact. Um, so for a lot of these heartbeat stars, they're hard to characterize from their light curves alone. So I led a project at Caltech where we followed a bunch of them up and got radial velocities. So here's radial velocity for this system. This gives us a really nice handle on the orbital eccentricity. And so we were able to characterize this. Kelly Hamilton did some nice work characterizing the light curve and uh, the radial velocity to get the system parameters. In this case, it's you know uh, an F-type star with the low mass companion in an eccentricity 0.9 uh, orbit. So with these system parameters, we can compute the tidally excited gravity modes that we should expect from this kind of star and see if it matches up with our expectations. Then we can learn something.
So like I said, the luminosity fluctuations we expect to observe are some, just some sine wave basically, whose frequencies are some integer multiple of the orbital frequency. And then they have some amplitude. Now the amplitude is determined by many different factors. There's the amplitude of the tidal forcing. There's a visibility of the mode that depends on orientation. There's like a forcing overlap with the tidal forcing. There's an overlap with the spatial structure of the mode. There's the luminosity fluctuation produced by the mode. We can calculate all of these uh, fairly well if we know the properties of the star. What's actually the hardest to calculate is this term. This is a resonant detuning term. This basically goes as the, the frequency of the mode divided by the difference in the forcing frequency, uh, which is some integer multiple of the orbital frequency, and the mode frequency. So if the mode is resonant, then these two are equal and this whole argument becomes very large. Uh, and even if you change your stellar model by just a tiny bit, you can totally change the, amp the size of this detuning and that totally changes the amplitude you expect. So basically we can't characterize these systems perfectly, but what we can do is statistically calculate what this should be and compare that with the statistical distribution of modes. Uh, so that's what I have done in some of my work. So gamma, this is a damping rate of the mode. Uh, that we can calculate just from linear oscillation theory, um, assuming that the damping is due to radiative diffusion, which I think is probably the main form of damping for these gravity modes. Nonlinear damping can be important um, in some cases, so that can affect this, so we have to be careful. Um, but in many cases, like I said, this gamma is very small. So um, what matters more is this detuning factor. Okay, so here's what we get for this system. The blue line shows the theoretically uh, expected number of modes above some amplitude. So the x-axis is a mode amplitude. The y-axis is number of modes we expect to observe above that amplitude. So we expect a lot of modes above small amplitudes and only a very small number of modes above large amplitudes. Is this, for one system this is just for this system. Yeah, you'd have to do this separately for each system, and so that's kind of hard to do. Uh, you can see that these low amplitude modes match pretty well with what we expect. The, red, the number of observed matches pretty well, but there's this huge tidally excited oscillation in the system that when we track it down to this blue line, we expect to see that less than 10% of the time in a system like this. So basically, this, it's, it's unexpected for us to see such a large amplitude tidally excited oscillation in the system. Can you go back? So there's a thin line in the center, and the diffuse um, uh, angle is this kind of Yeah, this is because there's some uncertainty in the parameters. It's, so what about statistical um, standard deviation? So I would say it's, it's really hard to estimate what the uncertainties actually are because you really need to know what all the systematic uncertainties are, say, in your stellar model. And um, so this is basically accounting for a factor of two uncertainty, basically, in the amplitude of essentially all these parameters, because we don't have a perfectly you characterized star. This is an a posteriori thing, right? You picked this star because it was interesting. That's right. So I do think we have to be careful. We picked this star because it had a large amplitude tidally excited oscillation. So that's definitely a caveat with this work. But in this system. In general, it seems actually quite nice. I would say overall. <laughs> it, it fit better than I thought it would, uh, this distribution. But yeah, what's, what's interesting is that this mode is not what we expect. Quick question about yeah. the formula. So, I mean, when you're dealing with a very high order mode excitement, uh -huh. um, you just go one integer away from that. Uh -huh. That formula seems to suggest that you get a strong excitation of, of, of closely neighboring modes. They're just slightly detuned from the forcing frequency. So that's true. It turns out basically all the modes are only slightly detuned. Basically, uh, all the modes are slightly detuned, but some of them this cancels out. This is like really almost, this is a very small number in some of them. 
there's there a suite of omega alphas that Yeah, so basically the star has a bunch of omega alphas, that's all the G modes of the star, and then there's also a bunch of forcing frequencies. And sometimes they line up very close to to the to be the same, and that's when you have a resonant mode. Wait, so omega N M is the forcing frequency. That's right. Okay. But that's basically the same as, well, it's roughly the same as this for the resonantly excited modes. So is there a population out there that don't have this one strong mode? Yes. Yes, there are. I mean, if you look at the light curves, well, I'm not going to go back. But yeah, they don't all show this effect. So we need to do really a ensemble study of the whole population. There are a lot of selection effects we have to be careful if we're gonna, of if we're going to do that. So. That should be done, but I haven't done it yet. So for this system, yeah? So, so you do a, a, an Anderson Dog test to see how, um, how far this outlier is from the, uh, or like it is to be uh, the same. I, I did not do that test. Um, the claim here is that in this one system, you only expect to see that an a mode that large amplitude about 5% of the time. This is non adiabatic calculation for the amplitude of the mode? Uh, so I do compute the non adiabatic G modes. So I have some hopefully good estimate of this gamma. No, but the correction factor uh, flux variation. Uh, so that also affects, yes, this luminosity amplitude, yes. That does depend on the non-adiabatic nature of the modes, which this is a radiative star, so I think it's things like convective flux perturbations are less important. But yes, so that is done there. I mean, I suppose there could be a problem with it somewhere. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably only order unity. I, I think this is close to the right answer there. Like I said, there could be some systematics that it's hard to know exactly how accurate all of these are. But I meant that if you move the amplitude, the amplitude is the uh, amplitude, moving by factor two because you didn't account for the non adiabatic But th this, this plot is made with non adiabatic calculations of the modes. Okay. So. Where do you have to tell us that the orbital frequency adjusts to? Yes. Okay, so I think what's going on in this system is a process called resonance locking. So here's the idea. The idea is that if we think about a mode that's very close to resonance, it gets excited to a very large amplitude, and that means it causes a lot of energy dissipation, and that will cause the orbit to decay. Uh, so if you look at, say, the orbital decay time, which I call t-tide, as a function of, say, orbital period or semi-major axis, if we zoom in to one location near a resonantly excited mode, there would be some point where this orbit is decaying at just the right time scale such that the mode stays resonant. Because remember, the star is also evolving on you know, a giga year time scale in this case. So there's some place near this mode resonance where the resonantly excited mode causes orbital decay such that the orbit decays at exactly the same rate um, as the mode frequency is changing due to stellar evolution. So the mode stays resonant. So you could think about, in this case, it would be this stable fixed point. We could think about putting the system right here and then perturbing it away. So right here, the, basically the orbit will decay is the same rate as this resonance is moving inwards due to stellar evolution. If we perturb the system away from resonance, uh, then the tidal migration time um, is basically longer, uh, and so this mode resonance will catch back up, and so the system will go back to the stable fixed point. If we perturb the system away towards the resonance, now the orbital decay will be faster, and the system will move back to the stable fixed point. So there's always some stable fixed point in these with these resonantly excited modes, this, this fixed point would be an unstable point. So the point is, if a mode is resonantly locked, its amplitude is basically determined by these luminosity factors, which we can calculate, and basically just the evolution time scale of the star, because this whole process is dictated by how fast this mode frequency is changing just due to stellar evolution, and that's something we know how to calculate quite well. So if a mode is resonantly locked, we should be able to predict its observed amplitude. 
So that's what I've done in this case. So this is a busy plot. What I'm plotting here is amplitude of tidally excited oscillations versus, versus their frequency. So the purple dots are all the observed tidally excited oscillations. The pink star is the really big one. Uh, and the green circles are the amplitude we'd expect a resonantly locked mode to have given these system parameters. So you can see it works out pretty well for M equal one, L equal two, tightly excited oscillation. We're pretty sure there's some spin orbit misalignment in the system based on the rotation period. Uh, so it's definitely consistent with, with being a resonantly locked mode. It's not a proof, but it's certainly consistent with that idea. Also, you see that this pink star is in this blue region of the plot. That's where, again, like I said before, it's really unlikely to expect to see a tidally excited oscillation in this blue region. We expect them to all be in these pink regions, which is mostly true, except for this one outlier. But that can be explained by resonance locking. Yeah? So this lower boundary here um, occurs because as we go to very low frequency modes, they basically become traveling waves. So that's, um, so essentially their damping rates become so large that this resonant detuning factor can't be too large anymore. So that's one thing that happens down there. So, and it, indeed we, you know, there is a pretty sharp cutoff. We see a bunch of frequencies here and then basically nothing. So I might've gotten this cutoff just a little bit wrong, but it's pretty close. How's the spin evolution calculated? So the spin evolution comes into this factor C alpha. So this time scale is determined by basically the stellar evolution time scale modulo some factor of order unity that depends on um, basically how the mode, this, well, it also depend, this also depends on M. So it takes into account the fact that if you tidally excite a mode and that dissipates, it changes the spin of the star. Exactly. Yeah, so, so that comes into that factor there. So whenever we do this, we always find the spin changing so fast. Yes. Kind of yes. So in many cases, that might be true. In this case, the mode is such a high overtone. It's 229 times the orbital frequency. So the, basically the ratio of energy to angular momentum yeah. is larger. And so the spin is important, but it's not necessarily dominant. And that's just because it's trying to push different layers of the star in different directions. No, so it's like it's that. no, we assume the star is rotating rigidly, which I'll address in the second part of my talk. But yeah, it's, it's because there's two things that happen. Is as the mode dissipates, it causes the orbit to shrink, but it also causes the star's spin to change. So you have to take into account both of those factors if you want to compute how the mode frequency changes. So, so that's all in there. Uh, I brushed over some of those details. Okay, so that's one case where resonance locking might be important. Another strong case I think is uh, we see in the Saturn system. So there are many cases where this physics might be important. Uh, in the Saturn system, tidal interactions are also very important. But here what's happening is Saturn is rotating faster than all the moon's orbit. So instead of the moon's orbits decaying, the moons are all getting pushed out, just like our own moon is getting pushed out away from the Earth. But the rate at which the moons are migrating outwards is uncertain because it depends on the tidal dissipation process inside of Saturn. And we know the moons are migrating, they're trapped in these resonances with each other. So clearly they're sort of pushing each other outwards uh, as they migrate outwards. Um, but that migration rate is not very well understood. So classical tidal theory, the way tides are usually um, parameterized is with this tidal quality factor Q. And the idea that that is that that Q is basically uh, inversely proportional to this lag angle here. So you can think of this moon excites a tidal bulge in Saturn. That bulge is misaligned uh, from the moon by this angle theta, which is one over Q. And so in this case, that would exert a gravitational torque that pulls the moon forward and makes its orbit expand. So we don't know how to compute what that lag angle is because it depends on the dissipation process inside of the planet. But I want to s try to get people to think in a different way. I think, think in terms of tidal cues, even though that's what lots of people like to do, is not a good way of thinking about the problem. Instead, we should be thinking of just about the source of dissipation, 
and what the effective tidal time scale is, which could be an orbital energy divided by an energy dissipation rate, which is the same thing as basically a semi-major axis divided by a migration rate. It's better to think in terms of these tidal time scales. You can talk about an effective tidal quality factor. This is just the definition of tidal Q. You can talk about an effective tidal Q in terms of what that migration process actually is. Okay, so again in giant planets we think that dynamical tides are very important. So I talked about gravity modes in those uh, main sequence stars. In convective stars and planets probably inertial waves are very important. So this is a plot from Ogilvy and Lynn of energy dissipation rate as a function of forcing frequency due to inertial waves in a giant planet model. And you can see that there are many, it's, it's very chaotic. You get many frequencies with large energy dissipation rate and other frequencies very nearby with very small energy dissipation rate. In this case, it's not due to resonances with inertial modes. It's due to the fact that the amount of dissipation you get for an inertial wave is very sensitive to its frequency. Um, so, but it's, the point is you can get the same physics where you can have moons get trapped basically in these resonances where the dissipation rate is large. And this is uh, treating the convection zone as a neutrally buoyant region, right? That's right. Um, yeah, f which is probably okay because uh, these forcing frequencies are much um, higher than any kind of convective turnover frequencies. So especially in giant planets to first order, they have adiabatic, at least their envelopes are adiabatically stratified. So, so the same process can happen in uh, planets where you could think of basically, if I think of a tidal migration time scale as a function of semi-major axis, there will be some semi-major axes where there's no resonance with a gravity mode or inertial mode, and so we have a long tidal migration time scale. But it's punctuated by these sharp resonances. This is a model computed with gravity modes instead of inertial waves, but you get the same kind of features with inertial waves. But the point is that all these resonant locations, in either case, they're moving inwards or outwards. So if any of these resonant locations are moving outwards as the planet is evolving, then basically what can happen is they can catch up to some moon and they can sweep the moon outwards and the moon can get caught in this resonance by resonance locking. So it's that same picture that I showed you before, but now we have to have that resonant location moving outwards such that the moon, because uh, the moons are moving outwards. So as long as that happens, there will be a stable fixed point where the moon can basically surf this resonant location outward. So. That's actually quite a useful analogy is that the moons are actually, they can just be sort of sitting there without much dissipation, but eventually one of these resonant locations passes by and the moon surfs it outwards. And in that case, this migration time scale is just set by the, um, basically the evolution time scale of Saturn itself, which we don't understand perfectly, but I think we have a better idea of what that should be than some mysterious tidal quality factor. Okay, so again, you can work out, if you assume a moon is in a resonance lock, you can take into account basically how the mode frequency is evolving, how the planet's spin is evolving, and all those things. What you can... Sorry, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm yeah. so used to my old picture of, oh, the planet is just slowed down by the moon. So what is the, the internal thing that makes it slow down, or it makes the frequencies go up, I guess it's both. Yeah, so in this case, so Saturn we know is evolving. Its luminosity is larger than its uh, absorbed energy. So there are a few things that could be happening in Saturn. One is there can be helium rain. Second thing is you can have the core dissolving. So the core could actually be sort of dissolving into the envelope. There's been some work showing that can happen. Um, so we don't know exactly how Saturn's structure is evolving, to be honest. But basically, as long as you get any of these resonant locations to move outwards, then this process can happen. It could be that many of them are moving inwards because the planet's contracting, so you expect the frequencies to go up. But some of them can also move out, and uh, that's probably the case with inertial waves um, because those resonant frequencies actually depend in a complicated way on the size of the envelope versus the core. So some of them can have their resonant locations move outwards, 
And if that's the case, it turns out this factor reduces such that the uh, tidal migration rate is basically determined by a spin evolution time scale of the planet. Um, so as long as some of those modes uh, have uh, resonant locations moving outwards, we expect this tidal migration time scale to be roughly the spin up or spin down time scale of the planet. But isn't the time scale for Saturn has to be billions of years, right? That's right. So it's pretty slow. It's pretty slow. It's probably billions of years. So I'm going to come to the data. But billions of years is actually much faster than what people thought, at least for some of the moons. So I'm, I'm coming to that. OK. So there is data on this problem. This has been meticulously compiled largely by Valerie Linné. He's used astrometric data spanning over a century for basically the locations of the moons. And so you can measure their migration rate given that very long baseline. So that's what Valerie has done. Uh, and as of a few years ago, it was just measurements. Well, it was, it was actually just Enceladus, Tethys, Dione, and Rhea. And so I'm going to write this in terms of an effective tidal quality factor right now. But what his data has shown is that for these inner moons, the effective tidal quality factor is of order a few thousand. For Rhea, it's of order a few hundred. Uh, and these are much smaller than what people expected. In order for the moons to have, if we think this tidal cue is constant, and we think the moons are born at the same time as Saturn, then their tidal cue has to be larger than this dashed line. And that's clearly inconsistent with some of these moons. So something is not adding up. Either the moons have to be younger, or this tidal cue is not constant. So this is a situation a couple of years ago. I've been working with Valerie and also an Italian group, uh, Luis Gomez, Paolo Totora, and a couple others, on measuring the migration rate of Titan. So Titan is Saturn's largest moon, and it's way out here at about 20 Saturn radii. Uh, and they have these very accurate measurements of Titan's position because Cassini did several flybys. So they can measure Titan's position to an accuracy of meters. And that gives a very good constraint, even though Cassini was orbiting for only you know, 15 years or something, that gives a very accurate constraint on Titan's location and hence any migration. Uh, so what they have found, so this is a really nice result. They have measured the effective tidal cue of Titan's migration, and it's way down here at a cue of about 100. And what's really nice about this measurement is uh, the Italian group measured it just from radio science, and Valerie measured it just from astrometry. And to with uns uncertainties, the results agree. So, Titan did not go all the way back to Huygens and look when he saw Titan on one side of Saturn. <laughs> That's at least a few hundred years. Uh, it's actually it's actually a smaller shift than that. We're we're still talking longitude shifts of like kilometers. Over hundred meters, over hundred of years. I'll have to get back to you on the exact number, but it's really not very far. <laughs> it's much less than one Titan radius. Right. I see. Yeah. So yeah. these are very difficult yeah. measurements. Yeah. That's right. Uh, I think that statement is true. Certainly over the Cassini mission, it's, it's a very small fraction of Titan's radius. So, so I think it's better, like I said, to not think of tidal cues, but think of tidal migration time scales. So when you calculate the tidal migration time scale, which is really what we measure, uh, it turns out that all the moons have similar migration time scales as far as we can measure, and that's about 10 gig years. So some of them might be a little faster, a little slower, but it's about a 10 gig year time scale. So it looks like they're all migrating out, again, on a time scale comparable to the evolution of Saturn, uh, which is a priori what, what we'd expect. If this migration time scale is like a million years or a trillion years, then it would be hard to explain. But this is what we expect for this resonance locking scenario. But don't, the, the time to get locked is not also giga years? Uh, you might have to wait for one of those resonant locations to sweep you up, but there's a lot of those resonant locations. So I'd say it should be much smaller than 10 gig years. Yeah. Displacement that uh, some uh, resonance um, experiences comparable with the, diff with the uh, difference between two resonance, with the separation between two resonance. Because if this is true, then every, every function gets swept. Um, 
So let me see if I understand what you're saying. You're saying these resonances can't overlap? No, no. So I'm, I'm just saying if you take the average uh, distance between neighboring resonances and you compare it to how much a resonance, resonance can, right? As if yeah, so they may have moved much larger. Yeah, so it might be that every moon should have been swept up. But there's a complicating factor, which is that the moons also catch each other into mean motion resonances. And you don't necessarily have to have both modes, both moons stuck in, um, in a resonance lock. So if we have one moon in a resonance lock and then it's in a mean motion resonance with another moon in a resonance lock, you might break, break one of the resonance locks. So you might just have the outer moon escape or you might have the inner moon just start pushing the outer moon. So what order resonances are you talking about here? So what do you mean? Uh, so these mode frequencies are close to Saturn, twice Saturn's rotation rate, assuming these are M equal two modes. So that is, you know, comparable to Saturn's dynamical frequency. Does that answer your question? So they are, they're probably fairly, that's right, but the forcing frequency in Saturn, so it's true that Saturn rotates much faster than Titan orbits, but the forcing frequency in Saturn is, just two times the difference. It's two times the difference in the spin frequency and the orbital frequency. And that's close to two times the spin frequency. So in here you assume the inertial or whatever modes you're talking about, the frequency is always dropping as well. You just have to have some of their frequencies being dropping, yes. But if you use generic inertial waves as a kind of contract, same momentum conserved. That's right. So I think if Saturn's structure is homologous, I don't think this can work. Yeah, so and assuming Saturn's contracting. That's right. So um, if Saturn's structure is exactly homologous, I think it would be problematic for resonance locking to occur with inertial waves. But probably, so there hasn't, there's been a little bit of work on this, I think, by Papa Loisau, but. Basically, the location of each of these peaks also depends on the ratio of your core size to your envelope size. And so you can have, you don't, as far as I understand, these peaks don't always have to move to higher or lower frequency. They are inertial waves, but, but the location of these peaks depends on the internal structure, the, the size of that inner radiative region, and that's probably also changing. <laughs> it's a hard problem, and I have not tried to, I have not addressed it yet. So then it can't resonantly lock. If all these mode uh, lo resonant locations were all moving inwards, there'd be no stable point. So then the resonance locking couldn't happen. And there certainly may be cases where resonance locking doesn't happen for precisely that reason. Various astrophysical scenarios where the modes are just moving the wrong way. Um, as long as we get any, though, that are moving outwards, we can have moons get swept up. Do you have any constraints? If you believe those ring modes, you know, set rings modes on that course, uh -huh. do you have any constraints on the structure? Any, 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 the problem is the, so we do have some constraints. I think we're still trying to understand exactly how they constrain Saturn's structure. To, to first order, those F modes we see are just propagating in the outer envelope of Saturn, which is the convective envelope. So it's not, it's not telling us so much about the inner structure of Saturn. But we also see in the rings evidence of G modes, which I didn't talk about today. And those are telling us that there is probably a stably stratified interior of Saturn, but we don't know its exact properties yet. But I'm working that, on that with Chris Mankovich, who just came to Caltech. Okay, so like I said, I think this is pretty compelling evidence for resonance locking. We, the theory basically predicted this migration rate approximately of Titan, and then that was confirmed. So I think that's a really nice piece of evidence in favor of this process, at least happening in this system. Well, actually, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, yeah. but why given the huge range of orbital uh, frequency between Titan and uh, Venus? Should uh, the mode be 
would all be at the same rate. So remember the mode is, what really matters is the mode frequency in Saturn's frame, Saturn's rotating frame. And in that frame, all these mode frequencies only differ by a factor of two or something. So I would expect these migration time scales to be similar within a factor of two or three or something like that, and that's what we see. They're not exactly the same, but to that level of accuracy, they're the same. Yes. If you, yeah, if they're all dropping at the same ratio, then we expect a flat line. Really, they're probably not exactly the same. And so, yeah, again, if we want to do better than order of magnitude, we have to do the harder calculations. So what about Jupiter? So I think the same process could be happening in Jupiter. Um, so Valerie does have a paper on Jupiter. So we know some, we have an estimate of the migration time scale of Io, well, the whole Laplace chain. I think it is of order gig years, but I, I have to go back and look at that. Um, my, my guess is it would be approximately consistent to the same kind of time scale. Um, but that is a little older. Yeah. Did the argument for individual satellites, but you have not coupled that to the fact that there are any motion resonance and then it. Yes, so the long term orbital history, which is what this plot is talking about, I think is really quite complicated because you have resonances between the modes and the moons, and then you have mean motion resonances between the moons. And so things can get quite complicated, and I think it's hard to reconstruct the long term history. But qualitatively, this theory does predict qualitatively different evolution on those long time scales. So this plot shows an example of that. If you assume that tidal, Saturn just has some fixed tidal Q of like a few thousand, then you get evolutionary tracks that look something like these dashed lines. Now these aren't accounting for mean motion resonances, but you tend to get this feature where basically we rewind the system just a gig a year or two, and we have the moons. They, they're coming out of Saturn just a couple of gig years ago, and that's a little hard to understand why that should be happening. Um, but in, if we think that this evolution time scale is more like a few times Saturn's age, which is what it currently is, then you get migration histories that look more like this. So we still have the moons potentially being spawned after Saturn's birth. That's not clear, but that's possible. But you sort of get these, you get slower migration uh, as we rewind the clock backwards. And the reason is the effective tidal quality factor is actually changing as a function of time because it's given by this big expression and all these things are changing. Uh, so from the measurements we have, it's consistent with Titan having started quite close to Saturn, maybe twice as close to where it is right now or more and actually having migrated out a long distance over the lifetime of the system. Same with Rhea and the inner moons, I think it's a little harder to say exactly uh, if they were born at the same time as Saturn or if they were spawned after Saturn's formation. There's still a lot of debate about that. Yes. I think you made an assumption. Would you be able to predict some like probability of mean motion resonances or how it ends with mean motion resonances or distribution of the same age or something like that? Probably, but it would fall back on models of Saturn's internal evolution, um, which I have not tried to do faithfully yet. Uh, I think we can we can get there, but it's going to be a bit more model dependent. So another conundrum this may help explain is Enceladus. So Enceladus has, is very active. Uh, similar to Io, it has a lot of geological activity uh, driven by tidal heating inside of Enceladus. Enceladus is in a two to one resonance with Dione. That pumps the eccentricity of Enceladus. As Enceladus's orbit becomes eccentric, it feels a variable tidal force from Saturn, so it gets stretched and squeezed, and that causes tidal heating of Enceladus which powers the geysers. We know Enceladus has a big liquid water ocean, and that's kept there by this tidal heating. We don't know the exact energy coming out of Enceladus. Estimates are upwards of 15 gigawatts. Um, but what's nice about 
this resonance locking theory is if we think Enceladus is pushing Dione out, so imagine Dione is not in a resonance lock and Enceladus is just pushing it out, then the tidal heating rate of Enceladus is just determined by basically its orbital energy divided by its tidal migration time scale. And we think we know what this tidal migration time scale is. J is just uh, the uh, order of the mean motion resonance, so this factor is just one for that resonance. So if we plug the numbers in, we expect Enceladus' heating rate to be about 50 gigawatts, and that's similar to what's measured. Um, so it'll, it can explain the tidal heating of Enceladus, um, and yet it can allow Enceladus to be several gig years old, uh, whereas if you think it just has some constant tidal Q, Enceladus has to be much younger. So it may help explain some conundrums like that. Be nice to do the same calculation for IO. I haven't done that yet. If we translate this uh, into temperature, like how much would the temperature have to, how much more than the uh, black body do you have to radiate over this energy? Uh, I believe Enceladus is quite a, is larger than black body, although it's only a few Kelvin, Hunter? Yeah, it's only the fast Kelvin. Yeah. It gets difficult because most of the, well, you, we can measure the energy coming out of the South Pole because there's a higher energy flux coming out of the South Pole. The rest of the planet, it's hard to actually measure how much flux is coming out. So the 15 gigawatts number is, is a lower limit on the actual heating rate. I'd say 50 gigawatts is quite reasonable. Yeah, Norm? Yes, sorry, this is confusing. This is now the Q of the tidally heated satellite. You're still relying on that equilibrium tide, essentially. That's right. I am not trying to explain the tidal dissipation inside the satellite. Now, these are solid satellites, so probably the equilibrium tides. They have solid regions. So we have estimate This is just the eccentricity of Enceladus that's very well measured. Okay, so that does uh, if we assume that the measure, that the heat coming out that's measured is in an equilibrium, then yes, we have a measure of K over Q for Enceladus. Um, I forget, I think it's the usual like 100, something like that. I don't think it's super surprising, although I'm not sure. I forget the exact number. Yeah, and actually there can be, I know there can be dynamical tides because you can excite modes in the liquid ocean of Enceladus. So, yes, um, I'm not trying to calculate that. So this, but this expression does not depend on that at all. This, if you assume it's in an equilibrium, then it simplifies to this really nice expression. Okay, so you have been a great audience. You've been asking a ton of questions, which I'm really excited about. I was going to talk about spin rates of stellar cores, but sort of out of time, and I don't think I really have enough time to address this issue. Maybe I will skip to the main point, which is that basically from stellar evolution, we don't know how to calculate what the internal rotation rates of stars should be. As they evolve, their cores spin up. Uh, so they should try to spin up, but if the cores are coupled to the outer layers, which are expanding, then that will prevent the course from spinning up too far. This is really important if you want to understand white dwarf rotation rates or neutron star rotation rates or black hole spins. This is the process that determines those, and we don't understand it. We have this amazing data from asteroseismology, which is telling us direct measurements of the core rotation rates of red giant stars. These are all like one to three solar mass stars. But we now have direct measurements from asteroseismology, and on the red giant branch, those spin periods are about 10, 20 days. On the clump, which is the helium core burning phase, they're about 100 days with a significant scatter. So this is giving us direct constraints on the theories. And what we found is that the theories that most people used in their stellar, stellar evolution codes up to a few years ago could not explain this data. So the measured core rotation rates are these points here. All the theories are these red and purple and green lines, which are missing the data by at least an order of magnitude. These are mechanisms that are trying to account for angular momentum transport due to hydrodynamic or uh, magnetic instabilities inside of these stars. Uh, 
and they're predicting too fast rotation rates. So they're not, they're predicting, they're not predicting enough angular momentum transport compared to the data. So this is a project, uh, this is a problem both I and Chris have been working on. I'd say we have two competing theories. Uh, I'd say right now they both look plausible. They both might be able to explain this data. Um, I'll just go over the basic. My idea is based on an instability called, a magnetic instability called the Taylor instability. So that, this can occur if there, you only start with a very weak magnetic field inside of the star. It can get round, wound up. Anytime you have differential rotation and a magnetic field, you wind up the field and amplify it. That can cause an instability called the Taylor instability. That can cause basically, uh, well, we don't really understand how that instability saturates, but it can regenerate the radial field. And so you can get Maxwell stresses. And if you can calculate what the radial magnetic field should be and what the horizontal magnetic field should be, you can calculate a Maxwell stress and therefore a torque or an effective uh, diffusivity. The main point of my work is that I think the prior prescription for how this instability saturates, which was developed by Hank Sproit, uh, we don't agree with basically how he calculates this energy dissipation rate and therefore the magnetic torques you get. So I'm gonna skip over those details the bottom line is we predict stronger torques. And when you put in that into models, you uh, can get results that are much more consistent with the data. So the red line is a plot of the rotation rate of basically the core of an evolving 1.6 solar mass star as it evolves. So here's the main sequence. Uh, as the star moves up the red giant branch, its core rotation starts becoming faster than its surface rotation. Uh, roughly in line with what we see for red giant branch stars. Right here is the helium flash. The core expands, it spins down, and that roughly gives you rotation rate in line with what we see for clump stars. At the end of the star's life, here's the asymptotic giant branch. The core contracts and spins up and gives you a rotation rate approximately what we see in white dwarfs. Is it still in that later half? Is it still is coupling at all important? There is some coupling here, but it's not it's not very much. Most of the angular momentum is extracted right here. So after that, it sort of evolves as a core independently. The specific angular momentum is almost constant throughout this phase. I think there's a little bit extracted here, but most of it is right here. Yeah. So let me tell you about Chris's um, mechanism, which is totally different. And the basic idea there is imagine you start with a stronger magnetic field such that your radiative regions basically are always well coupled by magnetic fields. Differential rotation is not ever able to develop except maybe at a few specific phases of evolution. In that case, the radiative core would have to spin rigidly or approximately rigidly. In that case, you ha we know there's a lot of differential rotation in these stars. Their cores are rotating much faster than their surfaces. So in that case, you need a lot of differential rotation in the convective envelope. And uh, what Chris and Yevgeny did is calculate uh, what the core rotation rate should be assuming a power law rotation profile in the envelope. Uh, and there's some justification for why it should be a power law. Uh, so what's really interesting is you can also get about the right rotation rate um, of the core for reasonable power laws. So I won't go into those details. Again, these models give something like 10 or 20 days on the red giant branch and something like 50 days uh, on the clump. So these are getting pretty close to the measurements as well. Now, the rotation profile would be much different, right? In this model, all the differential rotation is in the convective envelope. In my model, all the differential rotation is in the, in the radiative core. So they're totally different physical mechanisms, but they actually produce similar predictions, which has been very frustrating. <laughs> to try to distinguish these two. I think there probably are some ways of doing it, um, but we need to think a little bit more hard, a little, little bit more about that and how to confront both of these models with the data. So they both have some um, pros and cons, which I'm not gonna go into. I'll just wrap up by saying, if you put my model into models of massive stars, then you expect what you find is basically all, almost all the angular momentum gets sucked out of the core as these stars evolve. And this cliff where all those 
angular momentum is lost from the core. It's basically at the end of the hydrogen burning phase when the core tries to contract, but these torques prevent it from spinning up. And so it ends up pretty well coupled to the outer layers and therefore rotating very slowly. So in that case, you predict neutron star, initial neutron star rotation periods, which are quite slow, of order 100 or 200 milliseconds. That seems quite slow, but that's actually consistent with uh, what we see from many young neutron stars. Many of them are born very slowly. The crab, which is born at about 20 milliseconds, is an outlier in the distribution. Most neutron stars are born more like 50 or 100 milliseconds. Um, you can do the same thing for black holes. Uh, if you think the black hole is just made out of the helium core of the star, and you predict dimensionless spins of the black holes that are very small, 10 to the minus 2 or, or even smaller. Uh, at least for stars in single systems. We throw in binaries, some of this is going to change. Um, and I've worked on that. But the point is, for these single star models, we basically predict very low spin. And that's consistent with most of the Chi-F measurements from LIGO. So LIGO is measuring, for almost all systems, a Chi-F consistent with zero. So I think that's best explained as just a lot of angular momentum transport in the progenitor. And that means a slowly rotating core, and therefore a, a black hole with very low spin. So I think that's what's going on there. Um, we had a very nice quote recently on massive stars are very typically interacting. Yes. You have two massive stars in the and they get close enough for their end products to merge. That's right. That's right. So in, I have run some binary models. In my model is basically you can, there are a couple points here, this green and yellow one at larger spin. The only way I could get large spins from my um, scenario is basically if, if I have a tidally spun up star when it's in the helium burning phase, that's one way of having a rapidly rotating helium core. The other is with a homogeneous evolution, so a model that remains well mixed. So those can, at least in my model, produce uh, rapid rotation. If I just do a merger, like if I just spin the star up with a merger, say, at the end of the main sequence. Uh, there's still so much coupling between that envelope and the core that I still get a slowly rotating black hole. So uh, there are channels that can produce rapid rotation in my model. They might be different from the channels that produce rapid rotation in your model. So that's, again, something I think we should think more about. Uh, if you want black holes to merge with them, how would that be that because of the progenitors would be entirely locked? Not always, actually. Yeah, so, so, it's, so this particular model, I think, is when I put a binary in a half-day orbital period. That's short enough that they will, it'll get tidally spun up and it will merge in less than a Hubble time. You can actually make the binary a little bit more widely spaced. It will still merge within a Hubble time, but then tidal torques will probably not be strong enough to spin it up. So there's, there's been a few papers on that process. Duran Kushner, um, Tassos Frago. So they've looked at that. You, if your orbital period after your common envelope is more like a day or two days, you can still get a merger without getting tidal spin up. And these tidal physics are Q physics? Uh, in this model, it's just Q physics, yes. Um, Yes, Q non physics. Uh, yes, but so in the Q paradigm, which I has the whole half, first half of my talk was discrediting, but in that paradigm, basically, as long as you're close enough, tidal, it doesn't really depend what your tidal Q is, as long as your orbital separation is close enough, because the tidal torque scales so strongly with the orbital period. You always synchronize. You always synchronize. And if you're much wider than that, then you never synchronize. Um, now, again, I think we should revisit that, but assuming you can synchronize, then you can get this rapid rotation. Okay, I'm well over my time, so I'm going to uh, end and take questions. Thank you. I think we've had enough. <laughs>